the uh, life of the people that lived in a certain apartment building in Paris. All the people. He felt that, look here, we see these people living in those apartments in the building, but what happens in the internal life of those people? That was the scheme of the novel. In India, I have familiarity with Bengali literature, so I'll mention two writers, Shamoresh Bashu and Sunil Gangopadhyay. Both of them were hugely prolific fiction writers, wrote, wrote more than 100 pieces of fiction. They came from lower middle class background, had to struggle for money throughout their lives, but Again, as I said, when they achieved a certain measure of success, they wrote their masterpieces. Shamoresh Bashu, he based his novel on the life of Ram Kinkar Baj, a very famous sculptor and painter, which was published serially in the journal Dash. And Vikash Bhattacharji, the painter, as expensive a painter perhaps as M.F. Hussein, he illustrated each installment of the book when it was being published in the Daesh, in Daesh. Immediately it made a splash. Sunil Gangopadhyay, again towards the fang, fag end of his life, he, like Farooq Saab, he explored the 19th century Bengal. The heroes were, of course, Ram Mohan Roy and Tagore. And he wrote his masterpiece, in fact, two of them. One is Pratham Alo, and the other is Purbo Poshchim. What I mean is that here we have a book which is transformative. You read the book. I'll show you the book. In English, it comes to 100 pages. It's the monster of a book. You open the book with. 1,000 pages, yes. You start the book with a certain sense of resistance. Perhaps you cannot finish the book. But then the book grips you. It grips you by the throat. And you come to the end of it. And you find that there has been not a moment, not a moment when you were not surprised when there was not fresh moments of illumination. One point that has been alluded to yesterday is the extreme variety that is there in the book. You find that it is in the proverbial expression, God's plenty. Whatever profession you have, whatever spheres of life you have interest in, you will find something of it there. You are a historian, there is a good deal for you there. You are an anthropologist, there is something for you. You are a poet, there is a very great deal there. You are a cultural historian, there is something for you. You are in, interested in, the arms, in arms and ammunition, in jewelry, in carpet weaving, in miniature painting. You have something there. In fact, one, the very few haunting chapters in the, uh, in the book for me were those that described the Rajputana painting of Kishangarh school, Mia Maksusullah and his disciples who excelled in that kind of painting. Apart from this variety, a fact that has been alluded to yesterday is that language becomes a character in itself. Quite a few students here, and I'd like to address them specifically because our traditional understanding of language is that we have some things to express in our mind and we need the help of language to communicate. In other words, thought precedes language. You have the vocabulary appropriate for it. 
if you are not familiar with the vocabulary. And as I said, when I came to Urdu literature and Urdu poetry, I had my fair acquaintance with Tagore, Jibanananda, Dash, and so on and so forth. But when I was introduced to Mir and Ghalib and uh, other poets, I found that the patterns of feeling, the structures of emotions that are available here, at least some of them, perhaps they are not available in other languages. Because your structures of emotions also become sometimes dependent on the language that are available to you. So in other words, if poetry makes such a substantial presence in that book, the clue lies there that in the culture of that time, poetry had such an important place. It is not only that you encountered a situation, or apne socha ki is mauke pe ek share arz kar liya jaye ya sun liya jaye. The fact is that those, the treasure of that poetry is available to you, you are able to think those thoughts, which becomes evident as you go through the novel. The next thing I'd like to point out is the treatment of love in the book. We know that love as a feeling, as an experience, has been treated by all the great writers of the world. Dante, Shakespeare, Rumi, Tagore, Kalidas, and so on. Our writers too have done that. The love that has been depicted here through Wazir Khanum and her different husbands and lover is something so fresh and remarkable. I'm saying fresh and remarkable because Altaf is pointing to me, so I'll sum up. Remarkable because I have not found it in case of other great writers that I'm acquainted with. In Urdu, I'll refer to Quratul and Haider, Intazar Hussein, Abdullah Hussein. I find it, I don't find it there. He, she had four either lovers and husbands or combined, out of which I'll pick up Nawab Shamsuddin, because he seems also to be the favorite of the author. And I'll, I'll point out that when Wazir Khanum and Shamsuddin, they meet, they have the courtship and they make love, something incomparably beautiful happens. And that is one of his signal contribution to Urdu literature, Urdu fiction particularly, because it is not simply not there. And I'll sum up by alluding to one thing, that when the English uh, version had come out, I wrote a review for the Indian Express. A friend of mine from Delhi University, a very erudite scholar in his own right, he wrote to me that I liked your review, but what is the meaning of this term, Indo-Muslim? This term has been alluded to yesterday, so I thought that perhaps, look here, to our understanding, India's encounter with Islam is one of the most significant civilizational encounters in human history. And there is hardly anything in our cultural life that is untouched by the effect of that counter, that encounter. You take literature, poetry, music, painting, whatever. You find that they have been created by this encounter. If there is any master narrative of Indian culture, it is it, it lies here. And in this culture, if you encounter something that is incomparably beautiful, something that touches your heart, it may be a couplet from poetry, it may be something else, how do you appreciate it? You say, Subhanallah. Only God is untouched by blemish, as Faruqi Sahib has translated it. Perhaps you do this with the feeling that the object before you that you are appreciating, it reaches such near perfection 
that at that point you recognize that only God's creation is perfect. If anything else comes near to it, it is this. And when you read Farooq Kisab's novel, you are so affected by it, you were so fascinated by it, you come to, to the end of it and you involuntarily say, Subhanallah, Thank you very much. The theatrical act on the book will now be performed by Mr. Kartike Ambardar. He has been performing in the Delhi theatre circuit for close to a decade now. A PR executive by profession, he has in the past worked as an anchor with NDTV and has also acted with uh, many directors. He's currently working on a musical theatre production and a self-scripted short film. We request him to come on the stage to enact a few passages from the book, The Mirror of Beauty. Though she was the mistress of the teeming, prosperous establishment of Moss and Lake, her real position was that of a warm, attractive body in his bed. She came finally to appreciate the reality. It was pointless to expect that Marston Blake would have her in his house as his wedded wife and give her at least those rights which the Firangi Sahib suffered to bestow upon the Indian Begums to whom they were officially married. Not too many weeks after her coming to Jaipur, she heard about the circumstances of the celebrated General Palmer of the Deccan and General Gardner of Awadh, which encouraged her to dimly hope that a day would come when she and Marston Blake could spend their life as a respectable married couple, like those of other well-born families. She would adhere to her religion and her cultural practices. Marston Blake would follow his own creed, but inside the Zanana, the real power would be in Wazir's hands. Their children would grow up and stay in India and would rightfully be counted among the well-born Muslims. As she constructed these elaborate castles of hope in her mind, she did not take account of the fact that Colonel Gardner's Begum was high-born and that her people were not part of the plebeian class. She owned property in her own right and was a daughter of the Nawab of Kambaya. As for General Palmer's Begum, indeed, she was an adoptive daughter to the Emperor Shah Alam Bahadur Shah, who now rested in paradise. Where would Wazir stand in comparison to such eminence? It was like the lowly earth in contrast to the higher sphere where only spirits can dwell. Above all, both the general and the colonel had given up their native country for good and adopted India as their home. Clearly, Marston Blake had no such intent at the present time, nor had he even hinted at doing so in the future. Certainly, Wazir knew that even if the sahibs did not believe in caste or integral quality in birth, they were no less than Indians in the observance of rank and protocol and the regard that a person deserved by virtue of birth. On the contrary, the Indians had no problem with the women whom their own Indian masters married or with whom they had relations. They were quite willing to accept such a woman as queen or mistress or consort to the ruler. Yet, they were strongly prejudiced against and in fact almost abhorred the women possessed by the Firangi Sahibs. General Octoloni had a low-caste Maratha maidservant convert to Islam and then he entered her into a legal marriage with her. He remembered her in his will as Bibi Mutaram Mubarakunissa Begum, popularly called Begum Octoloni. That is, the Honorable Bibi Mubarakunissa Begum, also known as Begum Octoloni. He left her much money and property, yet the Indians obstinately refused to honor her Islam Islamic identity far less her Nawabi status. Her mansion, called the Haveli of Mubarak Nisa Begum, existed for many de decades with no one living in it. And as narrated by the modern Urdu writer Mirza Farhatullah Beg, it was ultimately purchased to house a printing press by one Malvi Karimuddin, known to later generations as Fallon's collaborator on his new Hindustani English Dictionary, 1879. The mosque that she built in Hosgazi near her mansion still stands but none go there to pray and people have named it Harlot's Mosque. Given these circumstances, could Wazir Khanum hope for any better treatment at the hands of her beloved compatriots? Was she willing to exist as a mere entertainment doll for an Englishman who not only professed a different religion, but was also of a different social order, as well as one who led an alien way of life? Granted that she did not want for, a, for com comforts and that Indians of the low caste stinted nothing in giving her honor and respect. On her outing, she traveled in a nalki, a closed hard-roof palanquin with a door and sunshade 
or a balcony at the front. Analki was permitted only to the rich and powerful. But how long was all this going to last? Wazir believed that she knew something about love, and even about ishq, a word that has so many meanings and is of such intensity that love is perhaps the most banal translation of it. Did she have ishq for Marston Blake? She knew most of the famous lines of poems about love. Someone seems to penetrate my heart without my knowing or asking. A fire seems to be raging in my breast. But what did the words really mean? Where did their truest meaning lie? The meaning that the heart should seize as the final, inelectutable truth. Did the heart always wish, always want that she should have her sahib in front of her always? He may be cold towards her or passionate, malicious or generous and loving. But she should have nothing in her heart but boundless attraction, constant susceptibility and unfathomable desire for Marston Blake. Did she have such feelings for him? She recalled some verses of the Persian poet Jami in his long poem, Yusuf Zulaikha. Driven to the frenzy of total madness in her love for the prophet Yusuf, Zulaikha had renounced the world and become a wandering mendicant. Many years later, when Yusuf entered Zulaikha, it was not the imperious, uniquely beautiful Zulaikha, none of whose companions and ladies and maids could even begin to compete with her in beauty, whose proud, remote behavior sent shivers down the spine of even the king of Egypt. Zulaikha's face was drawn. Her beauty's harvest was laid waste. Her back was bent and her steps on firm, stumbling. Her eyes no longer glittered like diamonds. Instead of gold-embroidered, brilliantly designed dresses and gem-encrusted ornaments, rags covered her cachetic body. Chami had described that poignant moment in the form of a question-and-answer dialogue between Yusuf and Zuleika, a well-known conceit of Persian poetry called Savalo Jawab. The great poet had turned it into a tour de force of lyric and tragedy. He said, Where is your youth? Where your beauty? She said, Far away from your union, I lost them on the way. He said, Why are your eyes so dull, so devoid of luster? She said, Immersed in blood, lacking the sight of you. He said, How did your proud cypress body become bent? She said, because of the soul-searing weight of your absence. He said, where are the gold and the silver that you had?